Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the show. And as you can tell, we are joined by a very, very special guest indeed. You guys may know her best as Kelly from Halloween 4, as well as Gloria from Bride of Reanimator. Uh, but coming up, you'll also know her as Rebecca Stout from the TV show Phoenix. We are joined by Kathleen Kinmont. Kathleen, how are you today? I'm fine. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for having me on. It's such a pleasure to, to have you on the show. Um, you know, you have you have quite a, a, a very, very impressive resume um, when I was kind of going through your IMDb. So it's going to be really interesting to get to speak to you and hear your story. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm ready to tell it. <laughs> Um, so as we'll start with, as we do with every guest, um, tell us about how you first sort of started in acting. Well, I first started acting uh, as a pretty young kid. Uh, my mother was an actress, so uh, Abby Dalton, she was a big influence on me. And I saw how well she handled both career and, and being a mom and her life and it just seemed really glamorous and fun. And, and she got to go places and meet people and put on great outfits and, and play crazy characters and things. And that was just, I guess it's just in your blood, you know, and you're a storyteller, you're a storyteller. And I love to read and I love to get on stage. I have no problem with that. I enjoy it. I love the, the feeling of, of embracing different human emotions and things that I probably would never get to do if I didn't choose this career path. I mean, you know, on a normal, people can't rip their heart out of their own chest. But when you're covered in A and B effects makeup, you certainly can. So, um, you know, it, it gives it another opportunity to really explore human behavior, which I'm fascinated by. And uh, so I, I really started, I knew what I wanted to do at about 15. 16. So my mom said, go to an acting class. That's going to be my first piece of advice. If this is what you want, you need to pursue the craft. And it's not just about getting headshots and an agent. You really need to be comfortable in front of people. And, and the only way you can find that out is when you get into a an environment where you're learning and you're being pushed into places that you've never been before. It's not, it's not a therapy ses session. It's a you know, it's an art form. So there's a lot of a lot to know about it and, and be prepared before you actually get into that real professional environment. So I followed her advice and I went to this theater called James Best Theater, which was in my neighborhood. I grew up in Toluca Lake, California. And uh, this was a theater that was run by uh, a lot of working actors, all adults. I was riding my bike to the theater <laughs> and uh, there was this one guy in the class and he was kind of in the back writing feverishly on his yellow notepad. And um, he always wanted to do a scene with me. And I was kind of, you know, a little, I wasn't ready for like, you know, guy and girl scenes yet. I was like, just put me in with the parents, you know, let me learn how to play a screwed up teenager first. And uh, that guy ended up being Quentin Tarantino. So that's why I titled my book, I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino, because I didn't want to do a kissing scene with him. And I <laughs> told the acting coach, like, please, no. And uh, I always beat myself up for that. But um, in, in effect, when I look back at it, I, I learned one of the most powerful things any actor, female or male, needs to say in this business is, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And... Uh, that was a great lesson. So that's something that we we all need to learn because as as actors, we get in these positions where we feel like we just need to people please a lot yeah. because we want people to like us so so darn bad, and it's a it's a trap. So you kind you can lose yourself and um, and then kick yourself and and have massive regret over trying to make something happen that wasn't the right timing or wasn't appropriate. So, um, so in that, I, I learned a lot from, from being a young person that was being asked to do different things. And, uh, and I think it served me pretty well. So, so I, I don't have a whole lot of dark stories about this business because I never got into precarious situations that 
I mean, look, and people get into precarious situations and they're very smart and they're very clever and, and you know, people become victimized. But my mom was really clear with me about the pitfalls in this industry and where people want to take you, especially young and naive and eager to work. So uh, I had some really great guidance and that helped. So it's hmm. probably why I stayed in the business for so long because I didn't, I didn't get really um, thrashed in it. Mm -hmm. And it has, it has that capability. It's a very, very tough business. If I had to do it over again, I would still do it <laughs> because I love it so much, but it's, uh, yeah. it's definitely, it's very competitive and, um, and also can be very rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's one thing, it's definitely something that I've learned a lot. I mean, you always hear about stories, right? Um, this is coming from kind of somebody that's not in the industry, like at all. So, but, but doing a lot of these interviews, I definitely find that the people that had really nurturing and long lasting and to even to this day still love the business and industry are the people that like you said had those moments where they you know if there was something they weren't comfortable with they they did turn around and say no and they kind of knew their boundaries and limits and and made people kind of respect that and it's um you know and I think I mean we've kind of seen right where people who weren't able to say that at the time because they were trying to people please and trying to find that path that they wanted um you know we see kind of the long lasting effects that ends up having on people so like for you I think it was definitely a blessing that you kind of found that really early on I agree I think it was uh something that my mom instilled in me she was a beautiful blonde target and it comes with the territory. I mean, it there's there's uh, there's good and bad of everything. So mm -hmm. you know, I'm tall, and you know, people look at that and they're like, "Oh, that's great." And then it's like, "Well, you're too tall." <laughs> or you're, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's something that's always too much of something that um, you just got to just what I do more than anything is I embrace the gratitude of the things that I have and try to stay away from the things that I don't and just look around and be very present and, and conscious of, of how truly blessed I am. And, uh, you know, getting out of things that compare me in my own sense of self, like, social media was not really great for me. I found it to be, um, uh, first of all, massive time suck. And then it, it's just incredibly critical. And yeah. and as we embrace that, our, our feelings of, of critical thinking is important. We don't always need to be put onto a, a place where we're always being criticized. And there's there's healthy criticism and then there's really unhealthy criticism. And and I found what what that platform did was give voice to a lot of unhealthy criticism. And sure. you know, gives when you give haters an opportunity to just hog the mic, then you're gonna be walking away not really feeling uplifted about anything. You're gonna feel defensive and you know, no, I want to show you I'm not like, you know, and you're like, what am I even <laughs> doing? Why am I just even step into this? So it's, uh, it's been nice. That's been a great release. Cause like, you know, back in the day when the only critics were what you read in the newspaper felt like a really simpler life. <laughs> and those people were being paid to be critical and, and had a, you know, a, a real wealth of information and experience, but now people are just kind of throwing stuff out and it, it it does still land. So I've I find that like if you're an artist, if you don't really have something to seriously promote, just stay quiet and just work on your art. Keep your head yeah. down and focus on yourself. Don't look at anybody else. It's a real tragedy when people feel like they can't do do it because somebody else looks like they're doing it so well and there's no way I can and it's it's defeating so yeah. I'm, I'm a very positive person and I think that that's a real challenge 
especially in this industry, just to, to remain that way. So I do a lot of things that keep me positive. I, I work out, I, I communicate. I've got a great family and beautiful support system with my friends. And you know, I do a lot of yoga and I eat right and sleep well, you know, all the things that kind of like, okay, how do, how do I just stay ready for that next opportunity? Because you're really only as good as your last one. And everybody, when you're working on the one that you're in, wants to know what you're doing next. So there's, it's a very hard, it's hard to stay present with that kind of mentality, always, you know, barking at you. And mm -hmm. like that, the last thing I did was not so great. Now, what am I going to, you know, I like, <laughs> I just want to keep like a really good steady momentum. <laughs> and stay out of the uh, the depression well, which is always ready and, you know, the water is always really nice and warm to just submerge and not, mm -hmm. you know, not be a part of, but yeah. I like part of it. I like, I like still auditioning. I mean, there, there's a part of me that really enjoys self tapes because I can get it the way I want it and I'm in control mm -hmm. and, and I can, you know, when I, when I send it out, it's like, okay, I did it. I'm done. And I don't have to think about it. Back in the day when the, everything was in room, all auditions were in room. Um, you know, there were so many moments where you're like banging on the steering wheel. Like, why did I ah, driving away? Like you only get maybe two cracks at it. Yeah. So, you know, it takes a minute, it takes a minute to embrace um, new characters, new dialogue. And so I keep my mind really active by embracing all of that reading a lot and reading out loud <laughs> no social media you yeah. know something i that's something that i would that's something i've really focused myself on this year is is i, I really do want to stay off social media as much because i found myself in a point where like if my friends or my loved ones or my family like if they would have like a negative post i'd find myself wanting to get kind of involved in that and then you realize like it takes so much time and so much energy and like positivity out of you. And you're kind of like, it's all for nothing. Um, and I can imagine as well for yourself, if you work in an industry where you are so heavily scrutinized down to appearance or personality or, or what have you, it could just feel like complete bombardment all the time. So I completely understand why it'd come off social media. You absolutely nailed it, Sam. That's so true. It is. It's a bombardment of emotional content that really is just only there for one day. It's like the it, it's like the, getting bummed out about a story in the tabloids. It's like really that's only there for one week, and then it's a the liner for a parakeet cage the next. I, the, nobody really cares. It flows through the masses, but it lands on you. Yes. And stays a stain on your thing on your psyche. And then you're left having to monkey brain this thing out of your out of your thoughts. And why do we welcome that? I, I hope mm -hmm. that at some point people, especially the young kids who are really, really addicted to it and feel like this is where they're getting their validation is from the likes and the reposts and all that kind of stuff that it's like this collective like, oh, I'm so over it. Yeah, I feel I, like I'm that will really happen. <laughs> I feel like there'll be a point where, I mean, it might not be for a while, but I think there'll be a point where it will just become almost boring to to kind of try and get that validation and because everyone's doing it they want to look for something different and then different is not having it so I think I think it will kind of come back full circle for sure hopefully anyway I think you're right I don't think it will be be soon but I think no. that it is there will be a wave where people are like oh no no put your phone down put it down we only take it out to shoot pictures and the, we'll share the pictures with each other. And and look, we'll we'll all scrapbook. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> That'll be the day. Um, so you mentioned about self-tapes. Uh, did you do a self-tape for your uh, audition for Phoenix? Yeah, that's an interesting question because in a way I did, but not specifically for this job. The oh, wow. lead actress, Laureen Price, she uh, was working with my manager 
for a while. And so when I would be submitting self tapes to my manager to send to the to the uh, audition to the casting directors, she would see them. So she wow. and her husband, Brian Lambert, who created the show, uh, he was also in the room with her because she would be doing it from home, looking at self tapes and submitting them. And they saw quite a few of my auditions. And from what I know, I think he wrote the character for me. Wow. That there wasn't anybody else even for that role, that they just handed it to me on a silver platter. But it was because of all the auditions that I was doing. And, yeah. you know, you never know. I mean, that's what that's really what they mean when they're like, you never know who's going to see <laughs> these things. Do your best. Don't turn in shoddy work. Take your time. Do your best. Show them what you got. You know, Absolutely. take chances, take risks, show colors, all those things. That's very, very true. You don't know who the assistant is going mm -hmm. to be tomorrow. That's and it. I mean, I, I, I hear actors are like, no, no, I'm turning this down because I don't know who that casting director is. And, and I don't think I'm right for it. Or, you know, look at the age. They want a 40 year old. I'm a 20 year old. And you're I'm like, don't look at that stuff. If they want to see you, they want to see you. You, you may not be right for this part. You may be right for three other parts that they have that they're not even listing on it that you just don't know. They want to see you do the audition and do your best and let it go. That's the one. Um, right. So in regards to Phoenix, uh, I understand at the moment it's in the post-production stages. Yes, it's ready to, to be sold. They've got different platforms looking at it right now. Uh, that, so, that's amazing so can you tell us much uh, I mean I'm not sure how much you're allowed to tell us but is there anything you can tell us about Phoenix or about Rebecca specifically Rebecca is a mom and she's a fierce mom and she's a from what her 17 year old daughter knows she's a an international corporate lawyer which I think is a really vague uh term for professional and you can just pretty much go anywhere in the world with that <laughs> and you know people are going to be impressed but they're really not going to know what you do um and uh she's working with people that she doesn't trust and she's so equipped at response to fight that flight or freeze aren't even in her wheelhouse she's just a woman of action and because she has no one else to rely on to protect her or her daughter she's you know doubly strong because she's gained that extra strength of what would be somebody else who was a protector and you know taken on protector for herself so uh that's probably all I can tell you about it <laughs> without getting in any trouble. <laughs> no, I completely understand. It's a great um, cast and it's really well done. I'm very, very proud of it. I'm excited. Yeah. Oh, oh, and the the my daughter actually plays my daughter in the show. Wow, so that I didn't know. See, yeah, so you will see my daughter, Aiden Grace, and she's a dancer and she uh, she's quite talented she just got accepted into a really wonderful uh, school of the performing arts here in LA for college and um, we're very excited about that so she's she's on her own trajectory of art and performance so proud that's it as as you kind of said before it's got to be in in the blood of the DNA because it's it seems to kind of sort of almost follow all of you really um, you know, and I, I think that's just kind of I do believe that performing like performing an art and, and that doesn't have to be acting. That could be uh, dancing or that could be music. Um, I believe that that's just something that is genuinely embedded in you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's clearly evident with with, with your family. Mm -hmm. Yes, we feel kind of circusy that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's either this or Barnum and Bailey. I mean, it <laughs> um, I'm so not we'll flexible make... enough for Cirque du Soleil. I'm not. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> 
She is. My daughter is. She could actually join Cavalia if she wanted. Cavalia is this really great circus troupe that does all that works with horses. And mm -hmm. she's an amazing equestrian too. But yeah, she's a dancer through and through. <laughs> she will be uh, on stage, many stages, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. she's she's definitely in it. My mom started off as a Vegas chorus girl. So that was in oh, her wow. blood too. And I ballroom dance. So I'm, I love as a dancer as well. I am. Yes. Wow. Yeah, I can, I can honestly say I am an amateur ballroom dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been paid for it yet, but I would like to one day. It's a, it's a wonderful, um, I think it's just a great skill set to have. And it's also just a beautiful way to connect with music and, and a partner and, I, I picked it up because I never knew really how to follow. I've oh. always kind of, I love to dance and freestyle, but never really knew how to follow the patterns of all the waltz and the tango and the foxtrot and, you know, all, and the rhythm dances like salsa and merengue and, you know, cha-cha. There, there's so many great ones and it, it's just a blast. It's, Mm -hmm. I I learned I started about two years before COVID. Oh yeah. wow, I, that's so, amazing! There is sorry. something beautiful though about ballroom dancing. Um, that I mean, I can't dance for any anyone or anything. So that's something I would love to. I'd love to learn someday somehow to dance, but I just don't believe that's. I just don't believe I can dance. I don't believe anyone can learn it because well, Sam, I've tried. I believe you can dance, and there <laughs> is a dancer inside everyone. And I'll tell you what: a nine-year-old girl on Google or YouTube could teach you how to do the foxtrot or the box step, and you could learn that really quickly. Just follow it on online, and all of a sudden, you'll be like, "Where's my partner?" I need a partner. <laughs> now I got this. Now I need somebody else to do it with me. I need a you know, I need the human contact. That was what I really was going there for. Is yeah. that I've been single for a very long time, and uh, I was I was just missing that human touch, and not in the way of like you know putting myself into <laughs> predicaments that I wasn't really looking for I just wanted that that connection yeah. and when you bring in great music and then you learn the timing of that music and you can hear it and then you start listening to pop music and you're like oh my god that's a waltz or oh my god that's a foxtrot that's a and you can you know you're listening to music differently and mm -hmm. And then when you get that partner or or multiple partners that's what's beautiful about ballroom you can just keep changing it out doesn't have to be yeah. one person and uh, it's a beautiful thing it's, it's a it's a really it's a, it is beautiful to watch because it does yeah. look like people are floating and they are <laughs> so connected it's pretty absolutely you know that's something you know that's what I'm going to set aside for my new year's resolution I know it's a bit late but this no, I need to not. learn how to do some kind of dance whether it's, it's just in time for valentine's day Oh no, that's too much pressure. <laughs> my my fiance is gonna see this. That's gonna be too much pressure. <laughs> oh, you're engaged. I am engaged. Oh, yes. Oh well, this is. You already have a dance partner. Then you guys are gonna have oh, to. Oh, I know, dance. but I've got away with it for so long, and, and now there's gonna be this pressure for Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh no, no! Just say, hey, I have a great idea. This by this, you know, we'll start on this Valentine's Day, and by Valentine's Day of next year, we'll see how far we've come. That's the one I'll use. Okay, that's perfect. Thank okay. you for the advice. I didn't think it would go this way. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Kinmont, sage advice. That's the one. I, I, I'm a big proponent of dance because dance is movement and movement is what we need to keep ourselves going. It is vital. And if you can just get up and dance just for three minutes a day and just turn on the radio and just crank it and just, you know, must have move for that is so good for your heart it's so good for your soul great for your mind it's a clarity creator and uh i i've just i've always been in love with it and yes i think ballroom dancing is a great way to bring that feeling into the person that you love and sharing that that experience together and 
it's a, it's a great way to to bring people closer together that's so beautiful you know that's that's an amazing thing you know and it's really nice because i you know obviously I, I interview a lot of actors but it's very much focusing on acting and the craft and and movies which of course we're going to get into um but it's really refreshing to hear to hear someone with such positivity about you know something outside of the the industry so that's that's really beautiful and i think i, I completely agree with you i think music and dancing just gives you a sense of freedom and release you can't get anywhere else truly and I, I honestly if all I did was focus on this business I would go bat shit crazy <laughs> there's too much you can't just yeah. you have to have a life you have to I ride horses I I ski I, I you know I mean that's a that's a real luxury but you know just getting into nature and getting away from all of like the expectations to be this something mm -hmm. and and you know why aren't I here and I'm only here and how do I do, you know you just you gotta you gotta have a life outside of it yeah. because if you don't have things to draw on as an actor <laughs> all you're doing is drawing on other movies you're like, um, well, I watched uh, this movie and that movie. Should I do it like that person? And you're like, no, no, don't do it like them. Do it like you, doing you yeah. in this character, making these choices. So, yeah, I love to watch movies. I love television. I love to be entertained. But I think it's really important to get out and away from all these devices and shut everything down and go and talk to your friends face to face and share a cup of coffee, don't pull the phone out, go for a nice nature walk. This, this, what we do is, is already too much. It, it's all, mm -hmm. we're already like, you know, hum, we're anthropologists looking at other people constantly. <laughs> and it's just like nice to just, uh, talk. <laughs> yeah, just absolutely. Inward right looking inward is really that's the, one of the greatest views we can have yeah absolutely absolutely um you know obviously as we said i know you're not on social media uh but what we'll do is we'll make sure that we keep a, a an eye out on phoenix uh whoever kind of picks it up and then once it kind of gets aired and confirmed we'll we'll uh, promote it out there because i'm really really interested to to see this show and also to see you in, in kind of like a newer role that'd be really interesting to see thank you i'm excited for it and the, and people can get my book on my website on kathleenkinmont.com that's an easy find i have two books i have another one um called magic and beauty too which is a children's book and that is my take on the creation of the world done by a pegasus and a unicorn <laughs> 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 the Pegasus has a lot of needs and the unicorn has a magic horn and he just grants all her wishes and then before you know it the planet earth is created and uh, <laughs> it was a great way to explain it to my daughter who was really young at the time of God and I mean I don't even know if we've all gotten the grasp of that either because that's a pretty <laughs> fantastical story too but um, yeah I've, I've got these two fun books that the I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino is, uh, and other short stories of epic fails and saves. It's probably the longest book title of all time, but <laughs> it's my spiritual satire on my life. Yeah. So it's uh, 52 chapters of just non sequitur stuff. And it's it's a real easy read. And, you know, it's, it's fun. It's got a lot of great pictures and they're both available on my site. Along with my yoga DVD, uh, yes. Kathleen Kinmont's Restorative Core Yoga, 33 Ways to Embrace the Ground. If you're not a yoga enthusiast, this is the perfect yoga for you because there are no standing or balancing postures. It's using the weight of gravity to uh, embrace all of the poses on the ground. And it's like perfect from head to toe uh what 50 minutes of just like vacation i think and without That's the script <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, what we'll make sure is at the top of the description we'll link your website um where we'll be able, where people can go and purchase your 
yoga dvd as well as both books i myself i definitely going to be putting in an order for the quentin tarantino book because i'm super excited to be reading about that so that'll be amazing thank you appreciate it i hope you like it i'm sure i will um so obviously uh you know we can't ha have this interview without obviously talking about halloween 4 uh mm -hmm. where you play uh, kelly mika um so how was that whole experience for you to to be on such a massive production set well it was a, a blast uh i was 19 um working with my friend sasha jensen and who played brady he and i had known each other from high school he actually took one of my best friends to prom and we all went to prom together so when i got to set or not to set, but to the hotel. And I saw that he was there. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be even more fun and more relaxed. And, and, you know, just, it, it leveled the, the nerves for me. Mm -hmm. And then meeting nine-year-old Danielle Harris, and she was so sweet and such a delight. And, and Ellie Cornell was so great. And so awesome, beautiful person. I mean, we all just really had a, a, a fun time, the four of us kids. But it was really when we were around Donald Pleasance that we all were kind of like yeah. sitting up straight and, and taking notice and realizing like this is a real, this is the real deal because he was the actor, the the real British speaking, you know, theater actor who had a great film career as well so mm -hmm. he had the pleasance presence <laughs> on set and it was it was neat to watch because he knew that he had this this special power and we all treated it with a lot of reverence um i mean i didn't really you know necessarily get to work with him one on one but i did get to watch him and I remember really embracing the fact that he was so kind to all of us and, and welcoming. And I asked him a few questions about acting. I, I don't even really remember what they were. I was just trying to make conversation, <laughs> trying to be cool. And, uh, and I just remember how he was, he welcomed it. He, mm -hmm. he enjoyed that. And it was a great set we filmed in Salt Lake City. So we had these beautiful craftsmen homes and the, uh, you know, so the sets were real. We never worked inside a studio, which I thought, you know, it, it gives a level of reality. The, the store was a real store. The house was a real house. The streets are real streets. You're not in a studio lot, um, which I mean, you know, you're an actor, so it really doesn't matter. But I just, I enjoyed the whole like walking through the house when nobody was in it and the smoke was still sitting there and the, you know, light was coming in and trees are waving. I mean, it had, it had this spookiness for sure. Yeah. And our, our Michael Myers was great. Uh, Wilbur Boyle. And, you know, everybody was just incredibly supportive. Dwight Little, our director was brilliant and and kind and never put us in any harm's way um we did have a lot of we did our own stunts basically i would say i think danielle harris did almost all of her stunts except for a couple where she had a, a double so it in reality i mean i thought that the film still holds up with what's out there even today i think it's still super entertaining and and it's it delivers, um, and that's all due to Dwight. I think he, I think he captured the essence of Halloween right in the main titles, and never lets you go. And Absolutely. I think I think because it was not just a little kid, but because it was a little girl. Yes, there was a another sense of just another level like next level fear that takes place when you're looking at somebody that's so cute and so vulnerable 
You know, you don't want her to get hurt. You're not rooting for that kid to get hurt. You're rooting for me to get hurt, which is fine because I'm a bitch. I mean, lessons to every girl who's thinking about stealing somebody else's boyfriend. Yeah, don't do it. Um, you'll get a riot gun through your torso and lodged onto the door. <laughs> What was that like? And that's not that even story. by Michael Myers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have been Ellie behind that shotgun. She should... <laughs> it starts off as Michael Myers, and then they cut to Ellie, just like, yeah, take that, yeah. you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was that like filming that? Because as you said, you, so I, I assume you filmed that stunt yourself. Um, yes, what was they that like? built a, well, it was a contraption that the stunt crew came up with, which was pretty ingenious. They um, drilled a hole into the door. They put a bike seat, a, like a 10 speed bike seat mm -hmm. onto that, into that hole. Then they drilled another hole above that where a cable wire that was attached to my harness uh, so they could pull me up. So I'm sitting on the bike seat. So my legs are dangling, right? Because my feet are off the ground. So I have a place to sit. But then I have this harness with a wire through the shirt that's behind me and they're pulling it behind them. So I, you know, like that, right? So they did it a few times and the harness was getting tighter and tighter inside underneath me. And by the time they took me off, which off the bike seat, um, I'd been up there for maybe about mm, 10, 12 minutes, not too long, but long enough so that all the, everything was just like squeezed inside my harness. And when they took it off and released the harness, everything went whoosh, like, <laughs> all the guts that, that were in, you know, oh. all my guts just got totally like squeezed. And then, then it released, that was a little uncomfortable, but you know, completely effective. And, and who cares about, who cares about that when, uh, when you want a great scene that's going to live forever, you know, you can withstand about 12 to 15 minutes of discomfort. I mean, I'm sure lots of actors have, I mean, forget that 12 15 minutes when i did bride of reanimator i was in six to seven hours of makeup every day before i stepped on set and then like three hours after a 12 hour work day to get it all off so i had full 24 hour turnarounds just to recover on my skin from the you know the harshness of it but yeah yeah i've endured some uncomfortable moments on film but what else would i be doing <laughs> being uncomfortable not working i'd rather be uncomfortable working than uncomfortable <laughs> not working <laughs> yes um you know i think that's i always remember with halloween 4 um i mean I, i'm sure you hear this quite a lot but i mean for me halloween 4 to this day is still one of my standout favorite halloween movies of the franchise and as 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 you said you know the movie holds up so well even to this day um, and I don't just think that's because obviously part three, there was controversy with not having Michael Myers. So they obviously hence the return of Michael Myers. I don't even think it's just that. I think just for, just for a viewing movie, if I took it as a standalone film, I just had so much enjoyment watching that film. I think in general sense, the cast is so young, um, not just with Daniel, but even with like yourselves at 19, um, I think all of you just did such an incredible job on that movie. And, and on behalf of a lot of people, I'd like to thank you so much for the work you did mm -hmm. because it's such an amazing movie. Well, thank you, Sam. I, I, I'm very proud of that film and I, I agree with you. I think it was really well cast and I think everybody brought it. I think uh, Danielle and Ellie had such a beautiful connection their uh, scenes were just seamless and and just felt so real. And it, I mean, it, you could watch any of any part of that film, and and I I think you're right. It, it's a it's an interesting piece. It's a it has a great pacing, and you know, 
Donald Pleasance in that ambulance, like, come on, that, that was so, so good. It was just, and, and it, you know, in a way it's really not that gory, that yeah. film. It's not, it's not like the, you know, intense, like sounds of stabbing chicken breasts that we get all the time now. <laughs> You're just like, oh my God. No. Um, it, it's really, it's suspenseful. Yeah. And when you think about it, like what's the sexiest thing? The sexiest thing is like not seeing all of it at once. It's like the the strip tease, the, the <laughs> you know, the the little glimpses, the the parts that are just like, mm, you know, that get your attention. And I think that Dwight knew how to do that. He knew how to tell a horror film in a very subtle way that makes you terrified. And you're it's it's not so obvious. And he's yeah. he's playing on your on your human emotions rather than trying to shock you into freaking into being scared. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I thought that I thought the Halloween that Rob Zombie did, the first one that he did, was so great because the um the exploration of Michael Myers as a as a human and why he became that person was so chilling to me because that is how people turn into killers is they is from abuse at a young age yeah so that was like oh wow all right the hateful stepfather who was super abusive uh william oh i can't remember his last name right now i'm blanking but he you know he played that so great and he's such a great actor he does everything is brilliant and so I, I think that that part of of the reality from Halloween four, you know, the little kid who's being, you know, tormented by the other kids, like, ha ha, you're an orphan, ha, you know that. It's like now you you you're feeling for this kid, and now you you rooting for them before you even know it, and and uh, yeah, I thought all of that stuff continues to play today. Yeah, it's it's very interesting you bring up uh rob zombies halloween one um i've actually interviewed somebody before that was on that movie and it works quite well with rob zombie um and he was so it's really interesting to kind of to hear your perception as well because i know uh, based on what this actor said lou temple that uh rob had such uh he wanted to pay as much respect as he could to the original one um as well as trying to tell the story of torment and and to understand almost like his background as to why he is the way he is because the story's never really been told um so that's really interesting right, he actually. came out with some compassion for michael myers yeah. right and you're like feeling sorry for the dude like man right, exactly no wonder you turned into this serial killer <laughs> yeah so it's really interesting you bring that up actually because i'm hearing quite a lot of different sides of it now so it's really interesting actually to hear Sure. Um, do you have any particular uh, fond memories you have from being on set? Um, well, I, like I said, I really enjoyed walking around the house by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and that was to really just embrace the, the spooky quality of, you know, it, do are these walls talking? And yes, they yeah. are. And they're watching every move. Um, it was really the stuff that was offset that was really great. Like we had a really killer indoor swimming pool at the hotel. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is such a fond memory. We every day after work, all all us kids were just like, okay, it's you at the pool, you know, and just because <laughs> it was cold. We were shooting in the winter because they wanted those yeah. stark trees and they wanted the, you know, that that vibe and um so it was really fun at the end of the day to just be kids and go swimming in this really warm indoor pool with a jacuzzi and because nobody we weren't old enough to drink that was just like that was our gather our watering hole literally and and it was a way to just kind of let the day go and yeah we're all we're spending a lot of time screaming or or crying or whatever it is being you know mean to each other you know being bitchy to ellie or whatever and then to have like <laughs> hey, see you at the pool later i mean that was just 
that's that's a beauty of being an actor i think mm -hmm. you can you can spend all day long having this intense emotion on somebody else and you're just giving it to them and you're just being you know mean or hateful and then at the end of the day when they call rap you're like hey let's go and hang <laughs> It's such it's such a sandbox, mm -hmm. and and that's why we love kids so much because they can play in that sandbox. They might have a fight, but by the time lunch rolls around, they're best buddies again. They you know kids let that stuff go. They don't know how to build a resentment yet. Yeah, and uh, that's that's a, like I think for me as an actor, like that's what I love about it is that like I can. I can explore all these different emotions. I'm working with an actor who's strong enough to take it. And then when they yell cut and that's a wrap, we can go and, you know, have a glass of wine or go and have a meal or, you know, it's like, there's no hard feelings. It's nothing yeah. sticks, but you, but you're exhausted and you're, you're spent yeah. because you've just had this emotional day. And so yeah, I think the swimming pool was really it was a godsend <laughs> that we had that. I'm really glad that they, I don't know if that was a production decision from the get-go, like let's find a, a, a hotel that has a pool for these kids so that at the end of the day, they can go and play a little bit. But we were all very protective of Danielle and uh, she's one of my great friends to this day. And, That's uh, amazing. Yeah, all of them really, Sasha and Allie. And Dwight too. I just did a um, well at, during COVID. I did a uh, an interview with all of them. I did, hosted this little podcast because oh, wow. didn't everybody like decide to have a podcast at COVID? Like, yes, what am I, I did. Do? <laughs> I did. Yeah. That's exactly when I started. <laughs> okay, exactly. So good for you. You're still doing it, and now you've got this new career that you know you're invested in and it's great but i i did two i did one with the halloween forecast and i did one with the bride of reanimator cast oh no with the hard bodies cast i just want to get the bride of reanimator cast and then i'll have my my trifecta podcast and you have and to get that cast <laughs> yeah that will happen um so, so speaking about uh emotions and you know it doesn't whether it's angry or you know bitchy or sad for yourself is it hard to just switch off your emotions like that like if you've had a 12-hour day filming in a particular emotion is it hard to then once the cameras are off to kind of switch back to reality and normal um well I would say it, depending on on how you know how deep you went or how I mean honestly I think it's a relief when they yell cut mm -hmm. um you know it, you, you the body can only sustain a single emotion for so long crying laughing smiling being bored you're gonna you're gonna move into something else I mean one of the best things I've ever heard was emotions are not directive. They're data. It's, it doesn't mean that you have to sustain being sad. Like, I'm sad. I feel sad. It doesn't mean, like, I'm going to be sad all freaking day. You know, like, I'm, I'm just sad in this moment. And then, like, maybe five minutes from now, something's going to make me laugh. Doesn't mean I got to feel mm. guilty about for my sad emotions, like, oh shit, I, I laughed and I'm supposed to stay sad, you know? I mean, even in even in working environment and you're in those moments of having a tearful experience that, that you're probably fighting because they usually say acting coaches are like, don't play the tears, fight the tears. Try not to cry. Because that's what makes the audience feel for you. If you're just gonna be like, ha, 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 just crying all the that's like comedy, right? Yeah. You know, the I Love Lucy cry is not the same as the Reese Witherspoon cry or the Demi Moore cry with the single tear. You're like, uh -huh. whatever. You're so even in those particular moments, I know that there will be something that happens on the set where somebody drops something or you hear somebody talking or you 
something's pulling you out of it, it's still part of what's happening, you know, and you can't be like, oh, shit, man, I just lost it, you know, like, no, you're still in it, because we're still right here, we're still with you. Now you have a new thing to cry about, that they just ruined your take, you know, or or something else, but I think that this, the whole human psyche of, um, you know, I think, I think some characters we don't want to let go of. I think that's where some actors are like, you know, like Daniel Day-Lewis with, with Lincoln. Like, I think he wanted to stay in that persona because some characters you fall in love with. Like Bride of Reanimator, do I want to take her home? No, the only reason I wanted to take her home is because she was still stuck on me somewhere that I couldn't get the glue off, (laughs) you know? But I, no, I've I've never been that um, lost in anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's being a responsible professional either. I think they're hiring you because they're counting on you to be able to turn it off. I don't think that being an actor gives you the carte blanche to be an asshole because I'm playing an asshole. They don't hire rapists to play rapists. They don't hire murderers to play a murderer. They're hiring an actor to bring that essence to a character. They're asking you to find out what you would fight for, what you would kill for, what's important to you that you wouldn't even blink about murdering somebody else. And, and as, um, you know, someone who's done a lot of work on themselves and has a lot to live for and a lot to be appreciative of, that's that's not a hard place for me to go at all. I would kill for somebody that I love, no question. Um, so I think that it's, you know, they're, they're counting on you to be a team member and to be responsible to that team. And I think going into that luxury of like, I'm going to lose myself in these emotions is kind of psycho and not really healthy. It's not healthy for the, for the crew and it's not healthy for the person who's doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we want, we want to feel like you're, you know, balanced and we didn't just hire somebody who's in dire need of therapy and they're using this production to work out all their stuff so sure method acting is good in I mean I would say with accents if you've got an accent that you've got to pull off sure stay in that accent throughout production why not that doesn't hurt anybody but if you're playing some depressed angry abusive human it's not okay to take that outside of of the confines of that piece that you're working on. Like, for God's sakes, leave it, leave it at work. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, you, you know, that's that's you've kind of hit the nail on the head. I well, for my opinion as well. Um, when you hear some of, I mean, I, I know it's it's all very like third person, he said, she said kind of talks, but when you hear like some of the stories that some people did to try and off camera to like freak out the cast or for the cast to really hate this person because they're supposed to be the villain. I'm kind of like, at the end of the day, it's it's all a job. Like no one should genuinely be terrified because you're supposed to be playing a character you are scared of this actor. Um, so for me, it's like, like you said, once the cameras are off, you leave it at the door. You shouldn't, they shouldn't be this terrifying people or hurting people just because that's the character you're playing. Completely agree. This is a game of trust. Mm-hmm. This is a, a, a place where you step in like the playground and you're trusting that someone's not going to hit you in the head every time you step onto the dodgeball. Um, and it's, it's not that. It's like it's past the ball. It's not throw the ball at somebody's face there are directors who think that they can do things to actors to try to get the performance out of them and it's it's despicable i think 
unfortunately, because of the, you know, speak up movements, um, Me Too and, and Everything Matters, everyone, um, we've collectively now found a voice that says, hey, you know what, there's been enough people that have already said something in the past, my voice right now is going to be part of that rising up and I'm gonna say something. And especially if I see something that makes me uncomfortable in this trust environment where everyone's been brought in to do a specific job, everyone should be respected and treated with that equal amount of respect and civility. And okay, star, you don't want me to make eye contact with you while I'm passing you? I mean, like, okay, whatever, you're focused and you're doing your job and I get it. Like you've got lines that you're running in your mind and you don't want to chit chat. And that's totally understood. But I think that, um, you know, some things I've heard too. And I mean, there was, there was one despicable thing that happened in Last Tango in Paris to that actress that was some whimsical idea of Marlon Brando and the director. And it destroyed her. It literally... I mean, I, I think she even committed suicide at the end of it or, or something horrible. But I mean, there's a lot of actresses, a lot of actors that that have been really put into to bad predicaments, either with somebody else they're working with or somebody who's at the helm. And, uh, you know, to that, I just say, you know, if, if you're in those kinds of situations, find a producer to say something to someone who's a higher up to um to to deliver a message that this it's not okay it, this is a it, this is like pretend i mean we're just telling stories here we're not curing cancer we're talking about it we're showing how people need to cope when they get it and this is you know, this is the, these are the things you say to somebody with cancer. I mean, the, like if you look at it, like what are we doing? We're here to entertain, inspire, and educate. So, you know, I mean, I think horror movies are really great at that because they show you how to get out of a bad situation. They okay. show survival. Yeah, Th that's what those shows are about to me, and I think. Um, you know, in dramas, they're about like how to ha have human interaction. I mean, some dramas are like, oh, at the end of it, I want to call my dad or I want to call my, you know, I want to call somebody who I haven't talked to. I've been inspired to do something because I've just felt an emotion that I wouldn't have felt had I not been sitting here watching this. So it's really like, well, okay, nobody needs to hurt each other for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's ways to get to a point. And I think the good ones know how to communicate. It really comes down to that. And, you know, preparation. So that when you, before you get to the set, you already have some really good ideas that you want to bring to it so that you're not coming there and going like, so what are, where do I stand and what do I do? And what's my motivation and all that, you know, ridiculousness that you should really already have when you arrive. You yeah. know what you're then now you're a real team member coming with a game plan. So I think that, you know, to, to get respect, you need to have respect the same way as a friend to have a friend. You need to be a friend. That's this doesn't just magically happen. Uh, so yeah. if we could just very, uh, very briefly uh, touch on uh, your role in Bride of Reanimator, um, as obviously you played Gloria, um, and as you kind of touched on briefly, the prosthetics. Um, please t tell us what that process must have been like for you. Well, it was long, and I would arrive on set probably around 1 a.m. and sit in the chair, and they would just start gluing all the different pieces onto me. It, it was a bodysuit. Uh, that went up one leg, up my torso, and then down one arm, and then the other arm and leg were marbleized and had prosthetic pieces glued onto them. So I kind of mm -hmm. stepped into this kind of naked suit of myself that we had um, done as as a cast at their at the K and B uh, effects group warehouse in Chatsworth, 
before the show started. So they had all these different body casts of me, of my head relaxed and quiet. And then with my head screaming because my head pops off of my body. I mean, I just completely disassemble. I'm, I'm a character that's made up of 10 different body parts. The, the legs of a hooker, the torso of a virgin, the arms of a waitress, one hand of a lawyer, one hand of a murderer, the feet of a ballerina. I mean, it was, it was a lot to take. Uh, and I think, what was my head? Oh, and my head was the, the uh, doctor's dead girlfriend or the, the, or the, the girl that who dies in the beginning, I guess her name was Gloria, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, I've got all these different body parts and the heart of doctor's dead girlfriend in my heart. Yes. So they started with that, the heart, then they got the head and then they just started, you know, bringing in body parts. So Brian Usina, the director really wanted everything to be this kind of spastic puppet, like, you know, not really, you know, they might have reattached it, but they didn't get all the ligaments and nerves right. <laughs> it still takes a lot of motoring to make it work. So yeah. that part was great, just the physicality. Uh, I really loved that concept and then bringing in the emotion on top of it and just being like confused and not like what, what kind of nightmare did I just wake up in? And what, whose body is this is I'm not recognizing it as my own and it's not even really responding the way that a normal body responds. But yet my heart is in love with this doctor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a masterful character. I mean, if yes. it, it really truly is because of all the prep work. That, that they did and I, I write a full chapter on it in my book mm -hmm. um, because of all the prep work being in a chair for eight hours that to me was my you know they say as soon as the actor has his costume on the character comes alive mm -hmm. my character was literally being sewn together like <laughs> like what the character was over an eight hour mm -hmm. surgery process every day before I stepped on the set. And because the, the suit was so intense, I couldn't really sit down in a set chair. So they built this fantastic lean to for me. In comes the bicycle seat again, my favorite tool. <laughs> <laughs> so they put a bike seat on this lean to and they had it covered in chamois, like all this sheepskin. And, and, you know, so I could lean up against something and just kind of take some pressure off without completely laying down on my back because my it was all my own hair that was just that was the big the big struggle with brian i, I begged for a wig but he was just like nope we're gonna use your own hair. so i would get home after you know monumental work day and and then have to try and get all those tangles out of my hair on oh, top of it i was just like <laughs> i'm an actor <laughs> <laughs> that was rough Thanks. But it was the standard by which I measure everything because yeah. I committed, I didn't quit, I didn't complain. I showed up, I suited up and I did my best. And, and I still had friends at the end of it. Brian, Bruce, Jeffrey, they were all so kind to me and the K&B effects group, you know, Bob, Howard and Greg, you know, like they really looked after me. They were my team. They didn't work on anybody else but me. It was just me that they were focused on. So that felt good. It wasn't like I'm standing there going, oh, guys, you know, where is anybody? They, I always had like a swarm of people around me at all times, lifting me up emotionally, making me feel safe making me feel um you know appreciated because there was something that like the first day of that when i came out on set and everyone was just marveling at like its creation and then you know then comes lunch and 
I'm covered in goop, you know, <laughs> with exposed nerves. And, you know, you don't really, you know, you show up with your plate of spaghetti and you're like, hey guys, can I sit at your table? And everyone's like, ooh, <laughs> gross. It did a number on me, I have to say. I was like, all of a sudden I felt like, wow, isn't this interesting? I'm I'm not with the cool kids right now. I'm kind of sitting off to the side, just eating a small amount because I wasn't, you know, I was like eating small amounts throughout the day to just keep my body going. But, mm-hmm. you know, it was, a, it, it was a challenge, but I met it and I would absolutely do it again if they asked. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think for you to go through that process day after day, just not only shows your love and dedication for the for the art and the craft, um, but as you said, that, that that situation, just eight hours in prosthetics alone would break so many people. So mm-hmm. I, again, I think you you don't get the applaudits that you personally, I think you should be getting for that because, you know, in eight hours just sitting there alone, I mean, for most people, that's a whole day's worth of work. And then you've got to work after that. So I think you deserve so much appreciation and credit for, for what you brought to the character. And again, uh, Bride of Reanimator is one of my favorite horror horror movies of all time. So thank you oh. again for what you did on that work. <laughs> well, I'm glad I did it just for you, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> glad you uh, see this much enjoyment out of it. A lot of people do. And and yeah. like you said, Halloween four was your favorite. They a lot I hear that from a lot of people as well. Both films. Yeah. I'm really proud of them both. And I'm I'm proud to be a part of this genre with those mm-hmm. two films under my belt. And uh, you know, I'm it, it's always nice to hear that that people appreciate the hard work that you put in and you know it, it it means something so thank you yeah no it's that's something I always swore to myself and also to people that listen because I always put out like polls on what kind of what franchise or what movie or what guest people would like to see and I've always swore to myself that when I get opportunities to sit in front of people like yourself I, I want you to kind of know how much the fans appreciate all the work and the effort you that you put in uh, because I don't think a lot of people don't get that opportunity to. So for me to to sit here with you, I I need to tell you like, there's a lot of people that have appreciated all your work. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate it. Um, just one final question: Is there anything uh, you want to say to uh, people listening? Is there any advice you would give people? Um, anything you want to say? Wow, I feel like I've already given so much advice. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, just be kind um, to yourself, to those around you. I think it's really important these days to know your surroundings, not just where you're walking into, but where's the other exit. I think it's really important to know who you're speaking to and who you're surrounding yourself with. Mm -hmm. I think it's really really important to be aware of what you're listening to and what you're letting your eyes rest on is it good for me is it healthy is it uplifting is it serving me i think that there's a lot of value in saying yes and there's a lot of equal value in saying no and i think that they're both very important words and uh you know Love your kids. They're really, they're tomorrow. They are our tomorrow. Be kind to the children out there these days. They're really struggling. They have so much that has been bombarded on them that we didn't have when we were kids. My daughter worries about going to school every single day and so do her friends. We have this disgusting thing happening in this country with mass shootings and it's it's so painful and uh we have people that do heroic things in really dire situations and you know those are the people that really need to be applauded the ones that step in front of 
assault rifles to try and stop, you know, another death. So, you know, like not to get heavy, but there are, there are really, there are some real advantage about knowing about the gift of fear. I'm reading a great book right now by Gavin De Becker. And, uh, you know, it's all about that. It's all about being really aware of what, you know, who's looking at me and who's that over there. And just, you know, we got, we got a profile these days. We've got to if you see something, say something. We got to look out for each other. I do believe that the majority of this planet is good, but the ones that aren't, <clears throat> hopefully they rise to the surface so that we can spot them quicker. But if we're looking for them, if you're looking to see if someone's not got a good bone in their body, there's someone's, you know, I don't know. It's it feels kind of overwhelming and hopeless a little bit, but I think that the more people just are are aware of what's going on, maybe I don't know, you can just save yourself in certain situations. Yeah. That's I mean, what I that's tell the... my daughter. It's the most important thing is just to know your surroundings. Drive slow. Don't cut people off. Let people in when they're trying to get into traffic. <laughs> it's cool. It's called good karma. <laughs> get it? <laughs> That's perfect. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to speak with you. My pleasure. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure to talk to you too. Thank you so much.